everyone. Welcome back to Bunga Cast, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. It's Wednesday, the 23rd of March. I'm Alex Ochili, and as always, I'm joined by Philip Cunliffe and George Hoare. Hello, guys. Hey. Hey, hey. how's it up? There was a meek little hey, George. Sorry, I was um, <clears throat> just about to cough, so I should have just <laughs> coughed off mic. Bad timing. No, I was going to say, George, you need some you need some fuel in there and fuel in the tank, which is which is appropriate because that's sort of what we're talking about. He, George is shaking his head at me going, that's just the <laughs> that's a George. Segue. That's a George yeah. pun. Yeah, it that's is. George's um, pun. That's why he's shaking his head, because yeah. he realizes that you're stealing. I'm, you're I'm, stealing I'm, from I'm, I'm stealing his territory, yeah. um, which is also a little bit what we're going to be talking about. Anyway, enough of my stupid puns. Phil, why don't you tell us what we're going to be talking about today? So we will be talking, or I'll be talking to Helen Thompson, who is Professor of Political Economy at Cambridge University, also a podcaster herself. She's um, one half of the Talking Politics podcast. And specifically, I'm talking to her about her book, Disorder, um, a lot of which is framed around the changing geopolitics of energy and specifically oil um, since I mean, since the beginning of the 20th century, right up to the crisis of Ukraine, though the book was released just before the invasion of Ukraine, although she anticipates it by talking about the crisis in Ukraine, um, as well as kind of how that is uh, energy has restructured the relationships between Russia and the US and other great powers. So plenty to talk about and hopefully without any puns. Yeah, no, definitely no puns in the interviews. Puns are for the uh, pre and after kind of things. Um, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing this. Um, I think these discussions around oil and energy, we've touched them on, on them on a lot of podcasts in reference to, to nuclear energy or sort of new how to approach maybe even more philosophically, you know, that we should strive to produce more energy. But the geopolitics of it is something that we maybe haven't talked about it so much, maybe because we have a bias towards ideas and ideologies and social movements um, and often don't talk enough about uh these kind of big material things underlying everything else. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> obviously Helen, a great person to talk to about this with. With um, I think that's that's one of the challenges. Get the get the analysis from the, I guess the material <laughs> base, as it were, to the some of the ideologies that sit on top of it. So yeah, looking forward to hearing this. <laughs> then a brief introduction to the base superstructure model there from George. Um, all right. Um, so you will very shortly be hearing Philip interviewing Helen. Um, but just before that, if you don't already, follow us on YouTube and all social media. We're at BungaCast everywhere. Uh, drop us a review if you like this podcast as well. And in case you happen not to be aware, our book explaining basically why politics is back, but why it's so weird and indeed at times deranged today. Uh, well, that book is out now. It's called The End of the End of History, Politics in the 21st Century. And if you're interested in more information, you can check out bungacast.com slash book, where you also find links to buy the book. If you need an extra incentive or extra convincing, uh, the historian Adam Tooze recently called the book a really fun polemical read. The journalist Vincent Bevins said, it's been a long time since the text was so useful, a clear, powerful, and panoramic analysis of our world at the dawn of the 2020s. Anyway, uh, what you're going to hear now is Philip interviewing Helen. Uh, the last part of that interview will be available only to patrons at patreon.com slash bungacast. And of course, at the end of inter every interview, as we normally do, we the three of us will get back together to tease out some of the wider implications of what we've just heard. Catch you on the other side. So hi, Helen, and welcome to the pod. Pleasure to be here. Uh, well, it's good to have you on the pod. And what I wanted to uh, just usually what we begin with our guests is just briefly talking about their personal background and how their how their life story and their career took them to uh, the views that they hold. So if you're an expert, you're a professor in um, political economy at the University of Cambridge with a specialism, particularly in energy. And I wondered if you could just briefly talk about how your personal background took you to took you to, into that career. And also, perhaps if your views at all had changed um, significantly over the last few years and in the course of writing this book. Yeah, well, I was quite late, really, to energy as a as a subject you know, i've been doing political economy since i was doing my phd uh in the 90, early 1990s when i wrote about the, the british conservative government mrs Sachs's government and the european exchange rate mechanism so my way into 
political economy was very much through monetary policy and through um, British politics and the monetary union project inside the European um, Union. And I would say in the latter part of the 90s, sort of when I'd been in Cambridgeshire for a few years and then going into the 2000s, I was very much interested in broadening out my interest in political economy and making it more historical. And that isn't something that I'd really done um, when I've been starting as a, a PhD student. I'd done something that was very present tense. I mean, I, I was quite literally writing my PhD on Britain and the exchange rate mechanism when Britain was crashing out of the exchange yeah. rate um, mechanism. And what I think, though, happened then was that really, I would say, in the immediate years after the crash, Actually, I go back a step. Actually, I, I think when I start when I started to think about energy was really when China's oil demand took off in the middle of the 2000s, so around 2004. Right. And it was some point after that that I first incorporated a topic on energy into the political economy course that I teach at Cambridge for third year um, students. I don't think I did it particularly successfully um, to begin with, but I just had this sense that this big change was happening and that whilst I'd grown up as a child in the 1970s and had some memories of the the two big energy shocks in that decade, one of which had come about um, in, a, in the context of the Yom Kippur um, war and the other which had come about in the context of the Iranian revolution. So they were essentially supply side shocks. Yeah. This was different. It was a demand side shock and also that it wasn't having it seemed anyway like anything like the inflationary consequences that the shocks of the 1970s had, even though in absolute terms uh, and in relative terms, actually, that by the middle of 2008, oil prices were significantly higher than they'd been in the late 1970s um, at their um, peak. So I had a sense, I think, from that point, there was something that was really worth paying attention to there, but I wasn't really doing anything about it in a systematic way not least because I didn't really know how to think about it and then I think I started really both paying attention and finding a way to analyze it once the shale boom got going because it struck me very early on that the shale boom in the United States was dependent upon the post-crash monetary environment and the extraordinarily low interest rates that had prevailed in the Fed's quantitative easing um, yeah. program so that was a way really of tying up my growing interest or growing interest from just simply looking at the world and thinking this is pretty important with my knowledge about monetary um, policy. And then the next sort of phase of development, so to speak, was is that I wanted to write a book about what had happened to Western economies after the crash. And I wanted to make energy part of that story yep. and oil in particular part of that story. But it was going to be partly about the Eurozone crisis, partly about the financial crisis itself, and then about oil. But I couldn't actually figure out a way of doing this. And the more that I tried to figure it out, the more that I just thought, I want to write about oil. Mm. Uh, I was also then in a position where I was about to take on a, a position in Cambridge that meant that I couldn't have leave for some time, for four years, um, having not had any previously for a couple of years before that. So I needed to do something that I could do without leave and write a short book. So that's when I started writing a short book on oil, oil and the Western economic crisis that I was writing, um, or I started it in the autumn of 2015. So I was writing it and I had a year to do it. I was writing it through the shock, so to speak, of 2016. So in the middle of the Brexit referendum campaign, I was thinking about oil and I just finished it when Trump was um, elected. And on the one hand, that that meant that I, in some sense, was standing at a distance from the things that everyone was getting most agitated about because I had to finish this book, particularly where Brexit yeah. was around the time when Brexit was concerned. On the other hand, I, it gave me, I think, the perspective of being able to see that there was something bigger going on and that actually there was a set of geopolitical and economic and monetary shifts yeah. that had occurred during the 2010s and that they were the backdrop in some sense to the more specific shocks that were experienced as shocks in, in 2016. And it was out of that sense. So the fact that I was preoccupied with energy whilst Brexit and Trump were happening and my thinking that I had something that could perhaps explain it differently. And in there lie the origins of 
me writing disorder. Yeah, that's um, that's fascinating to hear, and particularly the um, your as you say the PhD beginning with the um, monetary union and Britain's crashing out of the ERM, and maybe we'll go, come back to it because I was particularly taken with how you identify some of the underlying trends shaping those disruptive the disruptive shocks of brexit and trump in particular but before we go there and this is i suppose a somewhat indulgent question um for podcasters to talk about because you're also a podcaster yourself um and of, so you were one part of um or one half of the um the talking politics podcast which has just recently wound down and was hosted in um the politics department at cambridge the um along with david runciman and probably probably i'd say i mean correct me if i'm wrong but probably the large one of the largest if not the largest serious politics podcast in the world um and so i suppose i'm curious about your your kind of views having come to the end of that your views about that and how podcasting has if at all how it's impacted your your judgment your political judgment of events if it's changed your outlook or your views in any particular way or having such a kind of um a platform for public commentary on events as they're unfolding um if that's uh, altered how you undertake your analyses or impacted your academic outlook on things yeah, I have to say is is that the the success or the relative success of of talking politics you know, completely took me by surprise. Um, when David first suggested um, back in early two thousand and fifteen um, that he wanted to do this podcast and that would I be involved? To be honest, I think we had a fairly casual conversation about it in the corridor, like we might have had about any other matter. And I just sort of merrily right. breezily said yes. <laughs> fine as if we were discussing i don't know what yeah. uh, you know someone had said to um me then um that election as it was called then would become this thing that was talking politics and so many people would listen to it and then um express many of them or at least some of them anyway genuine sadness when it came to an end i think i would have been you know, entirely mystified so <laughs> i don't think one part of me ever lost that sense of like how did this happen yeah. um the second thing i would say is is that although there were times when it was quite difficult um particularly i would say in terms of the substance of talking politics um during 2019 um during the parliamentary struggles over yeah. over brexit and because everything was so fraught, um, I got a great deal out of doing it in terms of making me think about politics in a sharper way than I think that I had done before. Yeah. So I think that it was a learning exercise for me. And there were times, particularly because, you know, in a way it was really great, ultimately, that David wanted us to... Um, cover a, a whole range of different subjects. He didn't want us to just stick with what we thought that we knew about. He wanted it to be conversational and open to the world, so to speak, as it was changing and yeah. um, engaging um, with that. So as a consequence, I had to learn about things that I absolutely wouldn't have had to learn about uh, otherwise. And I think that it made me um, a better analyst of politics for, for doing it. Yeah. Um, so I guess that takes us then to talking, then getting into stuck into the book. And one thing that I was fascinated with is you weave three stories in this book, um, finance, economics, energy and democracy. And one thing that I was fascinated, the first part of the book is about energy and about um, well, fossil fuel energy, oil in particular at the beginning. And one thing that I was fascinated by was just how... Um, is just how intricate and convincing the account you give is 
of the role that energy has played in crucial kind of geopolitical pivot points over the course of the Cold War and over the course of the post-Cold War era. So how Suez kind of played out, the changing energy dynamics of Suez, how the Cold War, the end of the Cold War was shaped by Germany's going to turning towards the Soviet Union for its um, for its energy, how the um, shale boom in the US has changed the dynamics of um, geopolitics in the Middle East and changed the relationship between the US and China. And so all of this was fascinating. And particularly for me, I suppose, because uh, when I get undergraduates, um, there's a particular kind of usually male, cynical 18-year-old who comes into a course on international relations and assumes that it is all about energy and assumes that all it's about oil. And if there isn't, if there aren't any kind of, if there aren't any um, oil reserves to confirm, you know, why America's invaded somewhere, then it's about oil pipelines or something like that. Um, and I think that's probably an outlook that's reinforced by the computer, the strategic computer games that so many um, students um, that come to university play now as well, because so many of them are kind of configured around taking a number of resources in order to grow your empire or state or whatever it is in the context of the computer game. So I find, like I say, I find most of the time when I'm teaching that I have to kind of disabuse a certain group of students of their cynicism about international politics and to try and convince them that there are other things that matter actually in international politics. It's not just about oil. Um, but this first third of the book is perhaps the most convincing account of the fact that it is all about oil actually, or that oil is, you know, kind of pivotal to all of these, to all of these um, trends. So I wondered if you could briefly talk through um just, I suppose, briefly summarize the account of energy, but particularly with respect to um, the shale boom in the US and how you think that's altering the US relationship with the Middle East and how that alters the US relationship with China. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, there is a kind of crude version of the it's all about oil, which turns it into it's all about the profits of oil companies and the Western governments are um, are just basically pursuing the interests of Western oil companies. And I don't think that that gets us very far uh, yeah. in explaining why oil is important in um, international politics. And I think even when you take it as seriously as I do, you still have to tie it into other factors and see how that these things interact with each other. Um, so, for instance, I would say that you can't really understand the geopolitics of oil in the interwar years without also understanding European financial dependency on the United States. And partly the story that I want to tell there is about the interaction between uh, a world in which, in some ways, two European powers, at least Britain and France, benefit from the First World War in yeah. oil terms by having a presence in the um, Middle East. And one of them, Germany, loses out massively um, from that and I think that is pretty consequential then for what happens in in Germany um, there um, after but in other ways that the two European powers who've prevailed a bit in the Middle East including in many ways over the Americans uh, are in a very weak position because of their financial dependency upon the um, United States so I would always say take energy seriously but partly take energy seriously so you can see how it interacts with the other factors yeah and I would say that is part also of what then's gone on with the, the shale um, boom. And part of that goes back to the point that I made earlier that the American shale boom is dependent upon a monetary environment that inadvertently came out of the 2007-8 um, crash. And that made it possible, particularly early on, for a great deal of unprofitable production to take place, um, particularly in oil um, in, the, in the U.S., but I'd say that if we look at this in terms of, of geopolitics, why it was such a shock was, um, in, in, in geopolitical terms, was the world in some sense had got used to a situation in which on the supply side, there were two big oil producers, Russia and Saudi Arabia. Now, that was causing quite a lot of problems in a context in particular when Asian demand in general and Chinese demand in particular were rising as much um, as they were. It was causing supply side problems you can see really that in the middle of the 2000s the production of oil stagnates yeah. uh, and that problem would have 
carried on into the post-crash world if it weren't for the, the shale um, boom. But what the shale boom does ultimately is to turn the United States not only into the one of the big three, but actually into the world's largest oil producer. Um, and it also turns it into the, world, the United States, it, it turns it into the um, largest gas producer with a very significant export capacity in the end. Yeah. And I would say then there are two geopolitical disruptions that follow from this. The first in regard to oil is primarily about the Middle East, because this completely turns upside down US-Saudi relations. The Saudis tried to deal with the problem initially in late 2014 by crashing the price of oil and hoping at that point really to bankrupt as many US shale producers as possible, whilst at the same time hoping that that will hurt the Russians um, because obviously the Russian and um, sorry Russia and Saudi Arabia are on opposite sides in Syria. Yeah, but that doesn't really work for the Saudis. It doesn't have the effect that they hope. And so by the autumn of 2016, um, the Saudi king and um, Putin are making an agreement, essentially to join forces into this new oil producers cartel that's now called OPEC Plus, and that really changes the world again i would say um because now we still got these three large oil producers but two of them are in alliance with each other it's a quite uneasy alliance and they're basically forcing prices back up again and that's quite problematic in one way from putin's point of view in particular because it means that the prices are being forced back up for american shale oil producers they're benefiting from the um production cuts or the production control of production the OPEC plus is running without having to make any contribution to it, without having to make any sacrifices in terms of output um, for it. Now, that might have been one thing by itself. But the issue is, is that on the other side, on the gas side, there's something else going on, which is primarily about what's going on in Europe. So what, what essentially is changed by the rise of US shale gas is, is that Russia has now got a significant new competitor for selling gas to European countries. Some European countries don't want American gas, most notably, obviously, Germany, which doesn't build any liquid natural gas imports, and so it can't import it. Some European countries like Poland and Lithuania regard this as a complete and utter lifeline because it offers the opportunity to break their dependence on Russian gas. For Poland, receiving liquid natural gas imports is a matter of national sovereignty. So we've now got a tussle between the Americans and the Russians for selling gas in Europe at the same time as where the issue of the pipelines are coming into Europe from Russia in order to facilitate the transportation of Russian exports of gas into Europe have been hugely politicized by Trump, sorry, by by Putin, who who wants to take um, Ukraine out of the transit system. And so What I think we can see, particularly by the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, um, when the US Congress has slapped some really fierce sanctions on the Nord Stream, the second Nord Stream pipeline under the Baltic Sea, um, which effectively brings work on that pipeline, construction on that pipeline to a halt, is, is that Putin starts to move between the two spheres. He starts to think about how he's going to act in OPEC Plus in relation to the American sanctioning um. Nord Stream um, 2. And that, I think, is a quite unstable geopolitical situation. For a moment, it's kind of rescued, strangely, by Trump uh, in the, f- f- at the f- April of 2020, yeah. when the combination of, the, of um, the Saudi Crown Prince's actions and what Putin had previously done, did crashed the price of oil. And then for that moment, all three of the big oil producers cooperate together to bring the price um, back up again, but that accommodation was was never going to last. Particularly when you throw in, to say, the the the, the gas competition that that was going on between the United States and Russia in Europe, and the problem um, of transit through Ukraine. Yeah. Um, one kind of one thing that strikes me is in terms of your energy story, and perhaps this is pushing pushing it, but I'd, I I want to kind of just uh, I want to see. Um, how far you'd agree that the kind of the the benign era of the 1990s up until the crash in 2008 
um, and everything that was associated with it, kind of the high point of neoliberalism, technocratic post politics, the lack of geopolitical rivalry. How far did that period, that end of history period, how far was that floating on a cheap of on a sea, sorry, of cheap oil? I think that's absolutely true in the um, in the 1990s, at least after the, the first Gulf War that produces a spike in the in the price of oil. And, and then really through the rest of the 90s and in the very early 2000s, um, we see oil prices as remarkably, remarkably low. I think things really start to change, though, um, in terms of the judgment that's being made about them when the George Bush Jr. administration takes office in Washington. And then in terms of the um, price situation and the fears around it from probably from 2004, um, when Chinese demand has really accelerated and the evidence is becoming clear that some oil producers are struggling including some for domestic political reasons, like in Venezuela, um, oh. Chavez, uh, and also to some extent in Nigeria um, as um, as well. I think one of the things, though, that's really interesting about that period, let's say from like 2004 to the middle of, at least the beginning of 2008, is you have really serious energy inflation or not straight energy, well, just didn't, we have a really significant increase in oil prices that is that is uh, going um, on yeah um and there isn't much of a reaction to it in democratic political debate there is i think in the us by the summer of 2008 where before the prices crashed you starting to see energy becoming a really significant issue in the presidential election between obama and mccain and actually the issue putting Obama at some disadvantage, I would say, until the prices um, crashed. But one of the things that's really interests me, and this goes back to what I was writing about in more detail in the shorter book that I did on um, oil, is it is clear that central bankers in that period, say from the latter part of 2004 through to the middle of 2008, they really did worry about oil prices. Yeah. I remember when I first started thinking, well, maybe that there's something going on um, with the central bank decisions about interest rates during that period, because the Federal Reserve had started raising interest rates in 2004. I'll just have a look at, I thought then, a relatively quick look at the minutes of the um, Federal Reserve and European Central Bank and Bank of England meetings uh, in that period. And they're full of concerns about um oil prices. And indeed, the then um, governor um, of the, the Bank of England, Mervyn King, at one point gives a speech, this is 2005, in which he basically says what he calls nice, um, non-inflationary continuous economic growth has come to an end. Yeah. That, and that, that interlude, as you just described it from the 90s, he puts it back a little bit into the latter part of the 80s. He says it's over. Um, and it's over um, because we're returning to the world of high oil prices in which um, the energy producers have certain advantages. Um, John Claude Trichet, um, the president of the European Central Bank at the time, he goes even further in a way in a speech that that he makes and just says basically says Western consumers have just got to get used to this new um, energy world. Obviously, what neither of them foresee is the shale um, boom at this point. But what I do think is striking is, and it goes back in a way to the point that you started here with, is is that there's a disconnect between the awareness in monetary policy circles, so at the technocratic level, yeah. about the energy issue and the energy price um, issue, and the fact that it's largely kept out of electoral politics during that, yeah. during that, during those years. And so, I'm particularly interested in what your in your prognosis for how energy will factor into electoral politics um, in in the future. Um, but before we before we touch before we do that, I just want to quickly touch on um, the in Russian invasion of Ukraine, and how far that uh, how far that confirms or disconfirms the themes and arguments in the book. You've already mentioned the rivalry for the European market between Russia and America. How do you see Ukraine playing out in terms of these deeper trends? Well, I do, as you know, have a, a Ukraine story in the book um, in the third chapter of the geopolitics history um, because this fundamental thing changes in the what had been the Soviet 
European energy relationship and would now be the Russian energy, European energy relationship. And that is these pipes that were going westward um, out of the Soviet Union, then into Poland, and now going westward, Russia, through Ukraine and Belarus into Poland. And obviously the more consequential there is is Ukraine rather than um, Belarus. And that, I think, um, causes considerable concern even before Putin comes to power in Russia yeah. about how Russia protects its energy interests, its energy exporting um, interests when it's dependent for transit on a country which of which it has difficult relations going back to the, um, the, you could say, going back much longer actually than just the dissolution of the um, Soviet Union. If you looked at what had happened, you know, at the end of the the, the, the First World War, uh, in the relationship between Russia and the possibility of an independent um, Ukraine. So I would say that my story is one in which Ukraine is from the right from the beginning, from 1991, one of the principal fault lines, if not the principal fault line that's running through post-Cold War Europe. I think that Turkey is also quite an important part of this story. And Turkey and Ukraine are, I think, parallel stories, even though they're very different stories, um, because they're relatively large countries that provide borders for the European Union, or will in time anyway, uh, in the case of um, Ukraine, once various of the Eastern European states have acceded to the post-Cold War um, European um, Union. And I think there's was considerable incoherence in the EU's policy towards Ukraine um, that you can see really from, at the very least, from 2009, if not before, um, whereby you have the Germans having broken with Ukraine on the transit of gas in 2005 by agreeing to build the first Nord Stream pipeline, saying in 2008 with France that Ukraine can't join NATO, they're vetoing NATO's membership, sorry, Ukraine's membership of um, NATO, and then beginning these discussions on having what would effectively be associate EU membership for Ukraine, which would bring Ukraine into an economic alignment around the EU's single um, market. And I don't think that those positions could ever be all put together. And there's a reckoning around that um, in 2013-14, as we know, culminates in the annexation of um, Crimea. So I think it's pretty clear, in if you look at all the other Eastern European countries that join the EU, and I, I recognise that Ukraine wasn't actually going to join the EU, um, that either that they join NATO first, like Poland and Hungary and Czech and Republican um, Slovakia, or like the Baltics, they joined the European Union and NATO in the same year. But to say that you could bring the Ukraine towards an economic alignment with the EU whilst it was out of NATO and whilst you had weakened the conditions of its independence via Nord Stream, I, I think that that just couldn't have been made to work um, as a, a position. So I, I don't think that the fact that Ukraine has proven to be such a central fault line in the post-Cold War order in Europe is at all surprising from the story that I've told. Yeah, I wouldn't claim that I've got a, uh, a story that was going to in any way necessarily at all lead to the kind of move against Ukraine that Putin's made in the, in the last um, few um, weeks. I think, I mean, I, I don't actually try at any point to engage with the conceptualization of the Ukraine problem inside Putin's head. I mean, yeah. I have the kind of book that it, yeah. that it is in that um, respect. But I, I think that, the scale of the military action that Putin has engaged in over the last um, few weeks, I was taken aback by that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to move on to the some of the prognosis with respect to the green energy transition. 
And I was fascinated by um, the latter part of the book, we weave the story of democracy and energy back together. And in particular, so you've, you're very um, you're very kind of straightforward and blunt about this. So despite the lowering unit or the declining unit costs with respect to solar and wind, you make clear that until the problem of storage is solved, um, then with wind and solar will continue to be very intermittent sources of energy, particularly particularly in places like Europe. And you suggest this leads to a grim prognosis with the attempt to shift towards um, the green energy transition. There's the possibility and the constant warnings from politicians, including people like Angela Merkel, about the need for Western citizens to adapt to a very different kind of life. You suggest that, you know, it's possible to envisage a world where we have more political fault lines and even cultural fault lines around the energy transition. And you suggest, you know, you could imagine a world where we kind of regress to a pre-Henry Ford era, where instead of the car being um, something which is consumed by the masses, it becomes a symbol, a focus of class resentment and privilege, um, and the symbol of um, inequality for those who can afford electric vehicles and those who will be kind of shunted onto public transport. So I wondered if you could talk just a bit about that prognosis and how you see it playing out and what the fact, what the core factors are within it beyond the points I've mentioned. Yeah. I mean, I think that you've actually mentioned the, 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 the central um, problem were, which is that this energy transition um, is going to take a considerable amount of time that it's actually monumental in terms of what it would mean to leave fossil fuel energy behind or even to get to net zero where you still use it, we're still using fossil fuel energy, but um, balancing um, it off with carbon um, extraction. And I don't think that the ways in which net zero is being talked about by politicians in Western democracies um, engage with the magnitude of the transformation that it would constitute. I think that it also, as you've already said, Philip, um, depends for its success, net zero, on technology that doesn't yet exist. Now, that doesn't mean that that technology won't exist, but it does mean, I think, that we haven't got a very good idea about when it might exist. So actually having a strategy for how to get there when dealing with such an unknown is, yeah. is pretty difficult. And the same thing applies actually to carbon extraction, really, as it does to, as it does to um, storage. And then at the same time as we're dealing with this problem, of which is to say is enormous in size, is we've also got to deal with the fact that fossil fuel energy, particularly oil, but actually I think increasingly perhaps gas as well, is in its own terms in a crisis um, in, in that uh, oil is going to become more expensive yeah. and to the extent that it won't be more expensive, it will be because demand destruction has taken place and that is simply people were, or enough people and corporations won't be able to afford oil at the prices um, that it will go to. Um, and this was even before, I think was true before the Russian invasion of, of, of Ukraine um, with the levels of economic growth that we would like to um, see. So in that sense, it's a double energy crisis that's going on. We've got to manage the, problems that fossil fuel energy causes us and we can't just leave them behind because we can't get away from fossil fuel energies that quickly and at the same time we need to be moving away from fossil fuel energies when we can uh, and moving um, towards um, green um, green uh, um, energy and bearing in mind that that is also complicated by the whole set of issues um, in regard to the metals that are needed for that energy to be produced. So I think that there's been an assumption in the net zero project and the approach to the net zero project, which is to say, we can just carry on as we are. We can use the energy transition itself as a growth strategy and perhaps even as a, a manufacturing industrial um, strategy. And that what will ensue at the end of it is the same way of life uh, in Western countries, but with a different energy basis yeah. um, to it. 
And I'm not saying that that's a completely, you know, impossible um, scenario, but I don't think we would bet on it, shall we just say, as yeah. the most likely um, outcome. Yeah. And this is before we even get into the into the consideration that in developing countries, they want to be using a lot more energy than they're presently using um, per um, capita. And so I think that what we've done with the net zero is in the way in which it's been in the way which it's been conceived uh, is to assume that these difficult questions aren't really there or that they can be managed as we can go along. Um, but I think that if we take the car example, is that how can we be sure in any way whatsoever um, that it will be possible for as many people to consume as much energy, albeit now by electricity rather than by um, oil, and that that will be all turn out at pretty much the same kind of costs that it costs at the moment people to drive cars and use the energy um, that they that, that, that is required um, for that. And I think if we look at the, the history of cars, if we look at like what happened really um, before Henry Ford's Model T car came along, there was a very strong sense in which that this was quite dangerous political territory yeah. um, for um, democracies. You know, in the, in, the, in the United States, before he was president, Woodrow Wilson said that he thought it was the most likely way that um, the car ownership, minority car ownership, as it then was, cars for the rich, was the surest route to socialism yeah. in the United States. Such was the the the, the class envy, in some sense, and that 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 and resentment that it um, produced. And I think we have to just bear in mind the possibility that we could be going in the same direction with this, and whether actually the better approach would be to encourage much more expenditure on public transportation rather than to try to hold on to the idea that in the new energy world, as many people as do now will be driving cars. And as I say, I'm not saying that that's necessarily the, the, the conclusion we should, yeah. that should be drawn, that it should be public transportation over the aim for mass car ownership. But at the very least, I would argue, it's got to be part of the democratic political debate about the energy transition. It, it, we, we shouldn't just bury our head in the sands about the difficulty that this issue raises. Yeah. I wanted I wanted to push you a bit on something which is touched upon in the book, but I, I'm not sure you kind of provide an answer for it, which is right in the start of the book, you mention um, how, so you talk about the consequences of the 2007-8 crash, driving a flood of capital into the American shale oil sector. And you say how, as pressure for climate change, pressure for action on climate change accelerated investors desert American and European oil companies. So what a decade earlier would have been perceived as a medium term disaster for oil was now seen as promising evidence the world was on a three to four decade path away from fossil fuels to green energy. And so I was fascinated by this because why, you know, given all the uncertainty, like you say, um, over kind of securing the metals, given the uncertainty over whether the technology will be available and in what time frame for storage. Why, why did the investment class, why is it, in your view, why does it seem to have committed, pivoted so kind of um, confidently to, to net zero and to this pathway to the green transition? Um, is it kind of oligarchic or entrepreneurial hubris? Um, why or why not take the path of least resistance and kind of um, muddle along with fossil fuels without any kind of attempt to to shift towards the green energy transition, particularly given that they don't seem to be engaging in the kind of democratic debate that you say. So what do you think is driving the investor appetite for the, why are they so mesmerized by the possibilities of green energy, I suppose? I, mean, I think this is, this is a really interesting question and, and it's quite striking that there is a year really when a shift occurs. It's 2019. It's the shift and it's the, it's the year when the, the net zero by 2050 commitments um, start really coming in by major economies and led of the largest economies actually by Britain, one of the last things that Theresa May's um, government um, did. And you really see a, a, a watershed moment, I think, with ESG investing uh, in 2019 um, as um, well. I, I think part of the explanation on the investment side of it is actually how difficult things were getting on the 
oil and gas side of things. Um, so after the prices crashed in 2014, in late 2014, where they started falling, oil prices started falling in the middle of the year, but they really crashed. And then they were extraordinarily low in 2015, 16. And then there was a recovery after OPEC plus was um, formed. Um, but investment in oil and gas never really recovered from that moment in 2014 when the, when the prices um, crashed and went as low as that they um, did. And so the prospects for oil and gas as profit making activities with those prices and it, I, even I think at the level of which that they recovered um, weren't great. Yep. I think the other thing that happened um, in 2019 that focused minds on the difficulty um, around oil and profit making in relation to oil and oil's long term future was the situation in Iraq. So you see quite a number of the Western companies, Western oil companies um, that in late 2018, 2019, beginning pulling out from Iraq because they just lost confidence in the fact in the possibility that the Iraq's apparent productive capacity, which would be quite a number of million barrels of oil a day, more than presently being um, producing, can actually be delivered in the economic and political situation. Remember that Iraq had really descended into crisis in 2019. There were attacks on oil infrastructure. Yeah. So I think it, part of the answer to the question is, is a pessimism about oil and gas that was generated by oil and gas sectors um, themselves. Yeah. And then I think there was, as the politics of it was changing in 2019, in part inspired, I think, you know, like by the mass climate movement on the, the street, a sense that if something was going to be done to make the energy transition happen, there had to be a lot of money for, you know, behind it. I mean, vast sums of money um, behind it um, because it's dependent upon technological innovation and technological innovation isn't going to happen without an investment yeah. investment capital. Um, so I think if you put the two things together, you can begin to get some idea of, of what was going on. I mean, I don't think that's quite an adequate explanation and I, I haven't spoken to enough people involved on the ESG investing side to, 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 to sort of give a more, if you like, micro account of what happened than that. But if I was trying to explain it structurally, that's yeah. what I would, that, that would be my explanation. Yeah, no, and, and that's um, fascinating in itself. All right, that's the end of this part of the interview. If you want to hear the rest of the interview, uh, as well as our after party where we digest what we've heard and extemporate a little bit on what we've uh, learned, that is over at patreon.com slash bungacast. Mm-hmm.